Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather with us this evening, and thanks for joining us. As always, you can find your latest weather information and safety alerts anytime by calling us at 1-800-472-0391. That, of course, is the Alaska Weather Information Line. You can find all of this information on weather.com slash Alaska, including some of the TV maps you're about to see. Simply scroll down a little bit to the bottom of the page and look for Alaska Weather TV, and you'll be able to pull up the aviation maps, marine weather, as well as the surface charts, which will greet you when you come to the TV site. If you can't find what you're looking for, feel free anytime to send me an email. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you find me. I'm happy to answer any of your weather questions and direct you to the place in our web system where we have the information that you're looking for. And if I can't help you, I'll certainly find somebody that can. It's my pleasure to serve you any way I possibly can. Here's a look at the hazardous weather across the interior. For tonight, a winter weather advisory is posted from about midnight until midnight tomorrow for the Yukon Flats and the 40 mile country as well as the upper Tanana Valley. Uh, many locations here are probably looking at about three to five inches in general and some of the higher terrain could see as much as seven. As you move a little bit further southward though uh, into the eastern Alaska range and into the region around Denali we're probably talking about four to eight inches of snow and in some cases including around Denali maybe as much as 12. And that winter weather advisory will begin tonight around 6 o'clock and continue on through your Wednesday evening at about 6 o'clock there. Uh, so in general, if you're in the yellow shaded area, you'll likely see some snow. If you're in the higher train, you'll likely have snow accumulating. And for those watching around the Fairbanks area, in the valley itself, you're probably okay. You'll likely see some snow falling, but it probably won't accumulate too much. But if you're traveling over the Steese and Elliott highways, Chances are you're going to see it there, and above 2,000 feet in the middle Tanana Valley, there will be some accumulation. Again, as much as 3 to 5, and some of those higher terrain areas could see as much as 7. So, winter is almost here, right? Here it comes. Now, as we move ahead in time here and we take a look at the satellite picture, you'll notice a very broad area of low pressure tracking eastward. This is bringing a lot of a south and southeasterly wind up through southeast, keeping temperatures mild there. But uh, despite a little bit of rain here, it doesn't look like we're going to see a whole lot of uh, weather impacts besides some uh, probably uh, small craft advisories and maybe some low-end gales. Uh, the meat of this storm system is out here around Kodiak today. We have seen some storm force winds there. And a lot of moisture is working its way northward. So again, that's what's uh, causing all the snow across the uh, lower interior as we go through the next 24 hours there. A look out to the west shows a different pattern shaping up, uh, more of a west to easterly flow moving across the western Bering Sea. And that's going to grab onto some colder air. And as we go into Thursday and Friday, we'll likely see some of those changes heading toward the Norton Sound region, the Seward Peninsula, Kotzebue Sound, and probably the North Slope. Uh, we're not talking about any coastal flood issues just yet, but this is the type of situation that we do want to keep a close watch on. As we get into Friday, in many areas around the Norton Sound, Bering Strait, and Kotzebue Sound region could be experiencing 35 to 50 mile an hour winds. And it wouldn't be much of a stretch to see that five to seven foot uh, seas could be coming into the region and maybe pushing some levels, uh, water levels up anywhere from five to seven feet above normal high astronomical tides. So uh, we'll be keeping close watch on the west coast here as a stronger weather system is working across the western Bering. And maybe as early as tonight or into tomorrow, uh, we'll have some more information that would uh, be a little bit more uh, likely to show up as an alert on your uh, weather display there or uh, the, the National Weather Service page there out of Fairbanks. So keep watch on that. If you're around Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, Cotsby Sound, or the Chukchi Coast, again, a strong storm is going to move into the western bearing as we head toward the end of the week. Looking at the rest of the weather picture now, clouds have been pushing northward across the Alcan border and areas of rain and snow have been seen across the region. Another weather system is trying to work its way into the North Pacific here. This is really going to stay kind of out of our weather picture, but just kind of graze itself right across the uh, lower end of the map here. Right now, the main player is at 983 millibars across the western Gulf. Uh, that is creating a weather front right around the Gulf Coast. On the north and western side of this is where we're seeing the strongest winds as usual. Those northwesterlies coming through, really zipping out into the Gulf and pushing that front slowly to the east, squeezing out a decent amount of rainfall around places like Seward and Prince William Sound and certainly hit and miss into southeastern Alaska. High pressure has been breaking up the clouds on the northwest side of the storm and here is the next weather maker way out across the uh, eastern sections of coastal Asia. 
across the Arctic there. That low pressure system will just kind of crawl eastward, but really it's the next weather system in the uh, upper parts of the atmosphere that's going to give that the punch. As we look at the rest of the night, it does look like there will be periods of rain and snow across the eastern interior. And once again, most of that is more concerning at elevation, so about 2,000 feet and above uh, for any significant accumulations. Down below in places like Fairbanks, you're probably going to see a better chance of rain mixed with snow. But as far as accumulating snow goes in places like Denali, uh, that'll be in higher terrain there and could total to about four to eight inches, again, maybe a foot. A shower or a thunderstorm possible in the vicinity of this low pressure system at 994 millibars out across south central and into our Kodiak. Likely to see a little more wind than any wet weather, but there will be some showers passing over the Kenai Peninsula as it goes. Out across the west and over the Pribilovs, uh, showers of rain likely, and you can see again that weather system across the North Pacific just kind of crawling along the very bottom of your screen. Doesn't look like it'll have any significant impact except for the central and eastern Aleutians there that may have a little bit more of a stronger easterly wind at times as that is passing to your south. For Wednesday, showers and even a thunderstorm or two possible with that area of low pressure that's crawling toward coastal areas of southeast. Showers on the inside passage there and up to the north, cold enough air for snow across British Columbia and the Yukon. As we look in Wednesday afternoon, especially in the evening hours, there will still be an opportunity for some snow, mainly across the higher terrain. Now, as we get into Wednesday, Thursday, and into Friday, we'll watch for this next weather system to focus on areas in the upper Susitna Valley, uh, places like uh, Cantwell, Caswell, Northward. Don't be surprised to run into a little bit of snow as that works its way into the interior. Low pressure works into the Chukchi coast as we get through your Wednesday at 998 millibar low there. Uh, not much of a temperature change with that, but as we get into your Thursday, this reorganizes and deepens around the Gulf of Anadir. And a 987 millibar low will be working its way toward the Bering Strait. And at this point, you can start to see that westerly flow starting to pick up. Because of that, and we're going to keep watch again on areas around Norton Sound, the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island, Kotzebue Sound. And uh, all these regions could be dealing with some a pretty hefty wind for uh, at least 12 hours or so, or maybe longer. And some of that could reach up to 35 to 50 miles per hour. And once again, pushing in water levels that are 5 to 7 feet above normal high tide or over that high tide line. And in some cases, it could push that even further, about 8 to 10 feet above. So we're watching this carefully again. And so this will be more of a Friday, Saturday type issue here for our friends along the west coast. Now for the interior, high pressure is going to set up and, and slow this down. And what that means is any precipitation coming in will likely have a harder time getting established, except for some areas in the mountains. And we see snow across some of the northern parts of the Susitna Valley and maybe areas around Denali once again. The north slope looks to be generally calm. There will be areas of fog and probably some flurries there. And there's that southern storm just crawling into the western Gulf at 1,001 millibars across southeast, kind of in a uh, no man's land at the moment. Some showers lurking nearby, but you actually might clear out a little bit there. And as we'll talk about here in the aviation weather, uh, conditions could really improve for you as we head into Thursday, maybe Friday. Here's a look at the temperatures tonight. It's going to be a cool one in the north, uh, teens and 20s for parts of the Brooks Range, of course, with snow falling, lower 30s across the Arctic coast. But just uh, opposite of that, very mild across the west coast. 41 in Nome, 42 for Gamble, Subunga. Lower 40s for Bethel into Bristol Bay. Temps are just shy of 40 degrees. 44 around St. Paul, St. George, mid to upper 40s around the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. Southeast, you're looking at temps above freezing. 47 in Sitka, 46 for Ketchikan, and 44 for the capital city. High temperatures on your Wednesday in the lower to mid 50s, still fairly mild for southeast. South central, a little bit cooler there. 48 around Palmer and Wasilla, 52 for Kenai, 55 in Kodiak. It's still breezy there. 30s and 40s for the interior, 29 for Anaktubik Pass. And above freezing for the Arctic coast, the Beaufort and the Chukchi included. Constantly sound temperatures showing 46 for Shish and 42 in Kivalina, 46 in Nome. Lower to mid 50s for parts of southwest. King Salmon and Dillingham, both around 53 degrees, almost 50 in St. Paul and St. George. On Alaska, you're looking at 51. Overnight lows Thursday morning, hovering just below freezing for the middle Tanana Valley once again. Fort Yukon looking at 30, 29 for Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, 30s and 40s for southeast. Most areas around central and southern parts of the Panhandle will be well into the 40s. 44 in Kodiak, it looks like Point and uh, Port Hyden, also in the mid 40s. Lower 40s for the Pribilofs on Alaska, Dutch Harbor, Nikolsky, all in the mid 40s there. Adak, you're looking at 43. South central temperatures on Thursday, back closer to 50 degrees. Southeast, you're looking at lower to mid 50, Sitka 50. 57. Utkiavik, oh, about 40 degrees and 44 in Nome. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. 
And looking at your aviation concerns as we get into Wednesday morning, IFR will be fairly thick across the Kobuk and Noatak valleys all the way through the Bering Strait and the YK Delta and then across the Aleutian Bering Sea coast, especially on the west. For southeast, marginal conditions will continue there. Watch for a start around Chilkoot and White Pass with IFR. And VFR concerns spread over the Kenai Peninsula and into Prince William Sound. You'll notice VFR conditions, though, for a large part of Kodiak Island. This is Sitna Valley and areas north of the Alaska Range, all expected to start out with MVFR, you will find a couple breaks there north of the Yukon Valley and into the Chukchi Coast, but Beaufort Sea Coast regions will likely look at IFR as well as areas around Point Hope and Point Lay, generally to the west and south of that. As we get into the afternoon Wednesday, some improvement for southeast, though marginal conditions will prevail as you get down into Craig and Cloak, maybe some openings there heading toward the Dixon entrance, and north of Yakutat, all the way into Prince William Sound of the Kenai Peninsula, and continued VFR around Kodiak Island. Watch for IFR to be hit and miss across some of the eastern Brooks Range passes there, including Anaktuv Canadigan Pass, still looking for some improvement, but probably not all the way to VFR. Some of that will be seen to the west. IFR across the Beaufort and the Chukchi Coast into the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, down the Koyukuk and into the Kuskokwim Delta. Watch for hit and miss IFR across the Bering as well around St. Paul and St. George. Uh, marginal conditions are expected around the Alaska Peninsula with some breaks there around Dutch Harbor, Unalaska, and Nikolski. For the morning, IFR will be back around the Koyukuk and the Cusco all the way to the southwest, Lake Iliamna all the way out toward Naknek and it uh, looks like King Salmon and Dillingham included. South Central will sneak out with a VFR start, it looks like, around the Susitna Valley all the way into Prince William Sound and southward to Barrens, but MVFR is filling in around the Kodiak Island region. Southward across southeastern Alaska, you'll notice a little bit of MVFR and IFR from Hyder and westward toward Ketchikan and Annette. But north of that, really north of the capital city even, VFR is expected. Marginal conditions around Glacier Bay and perhaps Chilkoot and White Pass uh, and just south of Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather. IFR across the North Slope to start. And then as you get into the afternoon, some of that peels back even further into the Arctic with marginal conditions lingering along the coast. South of the Brooks Range summits, you'll see IFR conditions there into the middle Yukon Valley. But really, most of the 49th is going to experience MVFR through most of your Thursday afternoon. The big exception will be southeastern Alaska with just hit and miss conditions there. Here are your pass conditions for your Wednesday now. Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions improving toward VFR as we go throughout your Wednesday. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass expected to be marginal most of the day, with Rainy Pass also looking for marginal conditions most of your afternoon. Windy Pass and Isabel Pass will see marginal weather by the afternoon, but Isabel Pass may start with IFR concerns as you get your Wednesday going. Mentasta Pass also looks to be marginal. Tanita will start at IFR, but should improve to marginal weather as we go throughout the day. Portage Pass should see continued improvement up toward VFR and Chilkoot and White Pass with an IFR start should head toward an MVFR finish as we go through your day. Freezing levels show that cold air is poised and ready to move eastward out of uh, the eastern Asian continent there with a jet stream coming in more from the west, more of a zonal flow if not a little bit more of a uh, southern tilt. We'll bring some of that cold weather our way as we move toward the end of the week. But in the meantime, you're looking at southeastern freezing levels anywhere from four to 6,000 feet there. The surface freezing line generally just south of the Alaska Range summits. That's down to about 2,000 feet there with the surface freezing line still holding around the Yukon Valley. Across the Bering levels stretch from about four to 8,000 feet when you hit the Aleutians. Icing potential is lowering. Uh, well, the potential is growing, but the levels are lowering, I should say. Five to about 8,000 feet across the west coast with isolated moderate up and down the west coast, and a lot of that just in from the coast itself. 5,000 foot levels there across the eastern interior, all the way down toward Prince William Sound and Kenai Peninsula. Uh, again, as you move toward the southeast, the levels come up just a little bit to about 6,000 feet for isolated moderate concerns. The jet stream has a broad trough of low pressure stretching all the way across the 49th and into the Gulf of Alaska with wind speeds around 65 to 110 knots. A steady south flow coming up through southeast but more of a west and northwesterly flow moving off of southwestern Alaska and that broad jet stream coming in out of Asia is what's going to push that colder air our way. At 9,000 feet you can see several waves of low pressure here but the main focus is going to be that westerly flow coming ashore anywhere from 40 to 50 knots, a brief ridge across southwest but southerlies will continue to pick up across most of south or north and western Alaska. Light southerly winds across southeast anywhere from 15 to 20. Those are up to 25 to 35 across southeast to 3,000 feet. And here's our westerly or more zonal flow coming in, 20 to 30 knots. Stronger winds building out across the west and brief areas of low pressure that are strong across uh, northern parts of the Pacific reaching into the Aleutians at 40 to 50 knots. So turbulence concerns mainly across the Gulf for Wednesday below 6,000 feet, 4,000 feet out in the west and watch for convection out over the open water. A little bit of chop across Kobuk and Noatak valleys.
Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining me once again is Eric Stevens from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, based up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Eric, welcome back to the program. Hey, I'm glad to be here. And once again, you brought some wonderful satellite pictures to show us and do a little mm -hmm. show and tell about. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. I can get lost in satellite pictures all day. What, do you, what did you bring today? Right. Well, weather satellites, what mm -hmm. are they good for? Yeah. Of course, there's the pretty pictures that right. they bring us. You know, we've got a picture here from April of 2012. Okay. The SUMI NPP satellite, it's what they call a polar orbiter, right. which means it covers Alaska because we're mm -hmm. near the pole. Beautiful image, you can see a storm off of southeast Alaska, the, the sea ice along the Bering Sea up into the Arctic. A really nice picture, and this is important because it allows a forecaster to see where the storms are, where the ice is, where the clear areas are. Uh -huh. You need to know where the weather is now if you're going to forecast it into the future. Exactly. So satellites give us these good pictures. This is called surveillance of the weather. And you know, that same satellite also has another picture from a little more recently, August of 2014, mm -hmm. Tropical Storm Izel bearing down on the Hawaiian Islands. Okay. Hawaii doesn't get hit by a whole lot of tropical storms or right. hurricanes, sometimes it does. And here's a picture from the same satellite, the SUMI NPP Polar Orbiter. Mm -hmm. It shows Tropical Storm Izel approaching the Hawaiian Islands from the southeast. You can see the storm swirling away there, and then there's the Hawaiian Islands. This is a tropical storm not quite as strong as a hurricane because mm -hmm. we don't see the eye wall in there. This is still a serious weather system. And all of this information comes just from that satellite picture. It's so much information and it's wonderful to look at. You see the beauty and the awe of nature right there depicted in that weather satellite. We call it a polar orbiter mm -hmm. because the satellite flies um, high over the globe. Maybe we could look here yeah. at our, we happen to bring the planet Earth with there's us. Earth. This is our satellite, a polar orbit flies really close to the Earth, maybe okay. 800 kilometers over the Earth, and goes up over the pole and then back down, and then the, the Earth spins under the satellite as it goes by. Okay. That's in contrast to the geostationary birds, which are much further out, and they don't view Alaska quite as well. Okay. So we love those polar orbiter satellites here in Alaska. So when we're a lot closer, we get much better details and imagery and, and an idea of a better maybe position of what's going on when it's passing right over Alaska or right over Hawaii. Yes, exactly okay. right. The polar orbiter gives such a good view of places like Alaska. And because it's close to the yeah. planet, there's another aspect of satellites in the polar orbit that is helpful for weather forecasting. It's an aspect that's maybe not as immediately obvious uh -huh. as the pretty pictures that we see. Okay. And that is the capacity for the satellite to produce what's called a sounding. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, finding the vertical profile of temperature and moisture in the atmosphere. We've all heard of weather balloons. Right. Weather balloons are launched here in Alaska twice yeah. a day mm -hmm. at a number of airports, everywhere from Barrow to St. Paul Island to Kodiak, Anchorage of Fairbanks, Yakutat, a number of places. Launch these balloons, and we've got a picture of a balloon being launched at an airport, and the balloon goes up, it's pulling a little package, an instrument package with mm -hmm. it that reports temperature, pressure, humidity data back, and we use that information to help feed what are called numerical weather prediction models. Right, the models. <laughs> the models, right. It's a mouthful, so we just call it the models. Yeah. And these computer simulations, these models, they're computer programs that simulate the motion of the mm -hmm. atmosphere. Well, how does a model know what the future will be like? You have to tell the model what things are like now. Mm -hmm. And you give it all kinds of information, including information from these satellite oh, sounders. Okay. Wow. Very important. Just how important are they? We have a recent, comparatively recent study that really brings home, and this is Superstorm Sandy. Right. We okay. have a track uh, image here of the track of Hurricane Sandy it was down in the Caribbean around Cuba, and then it moved north um, over the ocean, offshore of the eastern mm -hmm. seaboard, and then at the last minute, Sandy made what's called the left hook. It, it turned hard to the left and slammed yes. into New Jersey. It was a major problem for the the uh, mid-Atlantic states, a calamity. It fused with another um, weather system and became known, this is not an official title, but Superstorm Sandy. Right. It was quite the weather event. Well, the modelers, after the event, there's a group of modelers in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, they have a very good model, a frustratingly good model if you're the Americans trying to yeah. pursue uh, their excellence. They reran their model afterwards in what's mm -hmm. called a data denial study, okay. where they kept everything the same. So this is six months after Sandy, but they went back, they reran the same model, they fed the model the same initial conditions, mm -hmm. that is telling the model, okay, here's where we think Sandy is, down near Cuba in, in the Caribbean. Everything was the same as it was in the real forecast, except 
they didn't let the model know. No satellite data. No satellite data. Okay. So we're going to put that over here. No yeah. satellite data for you. The resulting forecast five days out, yeah. back when the, the real Sandy was happening and the model had the satellite data, the forecast was pretty good. We've got a graphic here on the left side. We show the forecast of where Sandy would be, and that's mm -hmm. the red bullseye on the left. It's just south of where it actually wound up hitting. Uh -huh. Not a bad forecast from this computer simulation 120 hours out. On the right, you see the same model, but it didn't have the satellite wow. data to help it understand that? things. And the, the storm is way offshore. It misses. The forecast is more accurate when the model has the satellite data. So that's the, the idea today we want to convey is yeah. weather satellites, they're important because they show us the pictures of where storms are. We see right good examples now. of yeah. this. Yeah, the surveillance right mm -hmm. now, it's, it's great to look at those pictures. And in addition, behind the scenes, maybe not immediately obvious, but the models have to have that satellite data for them to be good forecasts. And then a, a meteorologist uses that information to help everyone with the forecast of where the storms will be in the future. That is fascinating information that we can, we can look at and see where things have been, because you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. That's that old adage there. But uh, seeing that satellites are actually helping us move forward in the, in the weather information system is pretty amazing stuff. You bet. And if you want to check out Eric's uh, satellite images that he's been talking about, whether that's something from today or last week or even much further back in Alaska history, you can easily do that yourself. Go to www.gina.alaska.edu and you can find those images there. Eric, thanks so much for joining us once again. And again, we will join you uh, hopefully again soon for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts where you'll tell us more uh, really cool information about the satellites over our heads in Alaska. Thanks for joining us tonight, and we'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with your marine weather and sea ice update. We'll apologize that our normal map's not available today as we're bringing some upgrades to the Alaska Sea Ice program and a small glitch this afternoon is producing the images in a slightly different way. However, the main point is still there and you can still see exactly this map at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. From Utkiavik northward, the main sea ice pack is about 350 nautical miles to the north and we are seeing some new ice growth there. And today is the old ice birthday. So anything that lasted over this melting season and into October 1st, well, it's now called old ice as this is a new water year. So happy birthday to the ice that survived. Let's take a look at the weather down in southeast. Southeasterly winds, 10 to 15 knots, uh, coming in around uh, two to three foot seas there on those winds on the inside. On the outside, stronger winds there as that front is backing right up against the outer coast, anywhere from 30 to 35 knot winds in most areas, looking at about 13 foot seas there, and then rapid improvement as we head into Thursday with light winds on the inside, 10 knots with two foot seas, and more of an offshore flow from Cross Sound all the way down toward the Dixon entrance, 15 to 20 knots with 11 to 12 foot seas, more of a southerly flow, and somewhat light coming into Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather. Look for six to seven foot seas in the northern Gulf. For South Central, including Prince William Sound, light winds inside the Sound and inside of Cook Inlet, but from the Barren Islands all the way into the northern Gulf, 25 to 30 knot winds will be possible, and it's certainly a, a diminishing wind based on what we've seen today. Seven to nine foot seas there across the Barrens, eight to 11 across the northern Gulf, and you'll see that all becomes light uh, and generally westerly as we get into your Thursday with one to two foot seas in Cook Inlet, two foot seas inside of Prince William Sound, and four foot seas across the north and western Gulf. For Bristol Bay, look for a westerly flow, 20 knots, five foot seas, six foot seas down the coast. Looking for a west and northwesterly flow for Kodiak Island, 20 to 30, and six to nine foot seas in most areas, 10 foot seas east of Kodiak, and four foot seas inside of Shellacoff Strait. That becomes more of a south and westerly flow for most areas, again, including Bristol Bay, 15 knots and four foot seas on Thursday, a southwesterly flow through Shellacoff Strait and from Akiok down toward Chignik. But look for a northeasterly winds to start to pull into this area of low pressure here that's just barely on the map. And that's what's happening here east of Kodiak in the western Gulf, too. 10 to 20 knot winds here with four to 10 foot seas. Most of the area is right up next to the coast, still influenced by the low pressure system much further east in the Gulf. As you look at the Aleutians, we're looking at generally 15 to 20 knot winds, anywhere from 15 to 20 knots with uh, six to eight foot seas generally across the west and a north and easterly flow pulling into that low pressure system just off the map once again, 20 to 25 there, anywhere from four to 10 foot seas. Looking for west and northerly winds coming across on Thursday, a little bit of a stronger southwesterly flow ahead of that next weather system in the western bearing. Uh, expects nine to 12 foot seas in the west, nine to 11 foot seas in the south and 12 foot seas 
across uh, the southern coastal areas of the eastern oceans on Thursday. For the west now, and over the next few days, we'll be watching the winds coming up here from Norton Sound and along the west coast, looking for seas ranging from about 4 to 9 feet, the highest of which will be at around St. Matthew. But generally, west and southwesterly winds, 20 to 25 should be expected, a little bit lower there around St. Paul and St. George. For Thursday, you can start to see the seas coming up here as much as 10 to 15 feet. Out across coastal areas, though, on Thursday, 4 to 7 foot seas outside of Norton Sound and through the Bering Strait region, 7 to 12 foot seas as you head out toward St. Matthew, and 6 to 10 foot seas from the Kuskokwim Delta out toward the Pribilovs on that 25 to 30 knot wind. Across the north slope, easterly is moving across the coast around the Beaufort, 20 knots with a 4 to 5 foot sea. Look for a south and easterly flow moving off the Chukchi, 20 to 25 and 6 to 7 foot seas are expected there. For Thursday, an easterly flow picks up around Kaktovik, 25 knots with a 5 foot sea, not as much of a wind around Utkiavik. And for the west coast again, a 20 knot wind coming up the Chukchi, generally from the south and southwest, looking for 4 to 5 foot seas, higher seas around the Bering Strait region. Recapping tonight's weather, convection is still possible around the Gulf, and that means periods of moderate to occasionally heavy rain closer to the coastal areas. A front should pass through southeastern Alaska, and rain will gradually diminish there. For some of the higher terrain around Denali and the eastern Alaska range, you may see as much as 4 to 8 inches of snow, and in some cases, as much as 12. Again, that would be Denali and the eastern Alaska range. Uh, north of that, we expect to see winter weather advisories continue from midnight until midnight on Thursday. And in those regions, 3 to 5 inches of snow with as much as 7 in some cases. For the middle Tanana Valley, it looks like a rain snow mix for you and little to no accumulation possible. But up above 2,000 feet, those snow totals could quickly add up again to that 3 to 5 inch range. To the west, another weather system is bringing some rain and snow into the western coast, mainly for the higher terrain. But it's the next system that we're watching to perhaps bring up some of those higher water levels to coastal areas as we head into Friday. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.